After the car chase that ensued a couple weeks ago between Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's car and paparazzi, I knew what I wanted to look into. Princess Diana. But as is my focus, not so much about what happened, but in how the media covered it. But what started as a look into the coverage surrounding her deadly car crash turned into a much larger project. To set the scene a bit, I am looking at coverage of Princess Diana from a few different points in her life starting with the months prior to her death on August 31st, 1997. And just to give you an idea of the size and scale of this project, I'm looking at archival papers. So this is only what has been archived and from the UK media. From just January 1st, 1997 till August 30th, 1997 was approximately 3,500 plus articles. And that doesn't include American media, any other outlet. That is simply UK media that has been archived. Before we zoom out, I want to zoom in briefly on an article from August 11th, 1997, roughly two weeks before she dies. The Sunday Mirror paid a quarter of a million pounds for a blurry photo of Dodie and Diana kissing. 250,000 pounds. Just to give you an idea of the frenzy and the hype that surrounded Diana, particularly when she was dating. Let's pull back out and start with January, 1997. In January, Diana goes to Angola as part of her anti-landmine campaign. And the coverage is, well, let's just get into it. Here's one from mid-January, 1997. It opens with, Diana, Princess of Wales yesterday, tried to throw off her image as a mere glittering celebrity by getting world attention for something more serious than a new dress or latest hairdo, landmines in Angola. Because according to papers at the time, women cannot have several interests, they cannot contain multitudes. You are either vapid or serious. Interestingly that this article goes the unserious route and focuses on her clothing and what she won't be wearing. Quote, Diana has abandoned designer outfits for the trip, determined to be noticed as a serious envoy and not a fashion icon. Yeah, a Dior ball gown doesn't seem appropriate for an anti-landmine campaign. That just makes sense. The coverage quickly turns into the UK government is angry at Diana because clearly this trip with the British Red Cross is wreaking havoc on the government. Allegedly, ministers have said privately that it is an ill-advised trip and not helpful. There's also this idea that her comments seem pro-labor since they are also on the side of taking action over this issue. Banning landmines, how could you? And then come the articles that she's just doing it for attention. Photo caption. Diana with a teenage landmine victim in Angola, the perfect photo opportunity. Gross. Diana's philanthropic efforts are routinely panned in the media as ridiculous. It's continually mocked. But another thing going on in January of 1997, staff is either resigning or they have been ousted or they got married, which obviously makes Diana the boss from hell, apparently quitting over the princess's alleged tantrums. You know, these stories feel familiar. Nah. As we move into February, 1997, Diana's motives are continually questioned. This is literally an article from two people who have written a book called Dicing with Die over basically stalking her for photos. According to these paparazzis, Diana wants to be a private person, but inside there's this little monster that says, no, you want to go to the ball and you want to be the Princess of Wales. They go on to say that using the word intrusion is unfair. So they bring up the Panorama interview, which she was coerced, and the Andrew Morton sit down interviews for a book about Diana's life as proof that it's not unfair. One is consent, the other one isn't. There's this continual refrain though of if she wants a private life and she wants to be left alone, she should basically be a hermit. God, that sounds familiar too. Diana also issues a libel writ against Express newspapers. Quote, the princess is claiming damages over allegations that she would receive money from the charity auction of her dresses, end quote. Diana does several of these auctions to get rid of some of her clothing and donate the money to charity. This clearing out is probably because she was embarking on a new life and new opportunities and new things that she envisioned herself doing. But it also feels kind of gloomy knowing what was to come. I also think it's important to note that there are various stories of intruders and stalkers getting on KP property. This I need to look more into, but it's apparently so bad that Scotland Yard orders a security shakeup, which couldn't be too comforting if you're Diana. 
and this is pure speculation, but maybe these instances made her a little wary, a little unsure about her safety and the security that was provided. But there are also bright spots in her last few months. She meets Mother Teresa and her hero, Nelson Mandela. It's not just hard to be Princess Diana, it's hard to impersonate her. Literally, a Princess Diana impersonator quits a 5,000 pound a day job. She said, quote, she could no longer cope with the constant attention and had found herself suffering the same domestic and health problems as her royal alter ego, end quote. Quote, it means I can't go anywhere without attracting attention. The lack of privacy has been difficult to deal with, end quote. According to this impersonator, it's so invasive and mentally and physically exhausting to be Diana that no amount of money is worth it. And one day, Diana has enough of it too. It's reported on April 1st, 1997, that as Diana was leaving a gym in Earl's court, she was snapped by a photographer and she had it. Diana starts yelling at the photographer to give her the camera and tries to get it from him. A passerby named Kevin got involved and tried to help Diana wrangle the film. And you really can't blame her for being absolutely exhausted. But then comes the media coverage. First, the mirror makes this claim that they will no longer buy pictures of Princess Diana. They seemingly break this promise pretty quickly because they buy the $250,000 pound pictures of Dodie and Diana in August. But it's not because they're taking a closer look and self-reflecting on the role of paparazzi in society or someone's right to privacy. No, the real problem is a member of the public tried to get involved and held a paparazzi cameraman's wrist so that Diana could get the film. They call it a new low when a member of the public used violence against the paparazzi. But the mirror also acknowledges that the intrusive behavior on her life is unacceptable. It ends on a somewhat noble note acknowledging Diana's need for privacy, but then they break it by buying pap photos of Dodie and Di kissing. Make it make sense. Coverage of this incident continues to spiral. Carol Malone claims that Diana is in danger of going a tier too far. Apparently it's a result of Diana's education that she is now addicted to the male attention because everything we do as women is for the male gaze. The basis of Carol's hypothesis, quote, why else would she join a sweaty little known Earl's Court gym called Muscle Mary's where most of the meatheads pumping iron are men, end quote. Carol, you might've answered the question for yourself. It's a little known gym. I'm assuming she's not meaning this in a sarcastic way. And maybe she's hoping if it's mostly men, she will just be left alone. That if she goes to a serious gym where they're just working out and getting out of there, she might be able to leave undetected. She goes on to say about the incident, quote, why would she even think about asking a passerby to get involved in a public brawl to retrieve a film that was nothing more exciting on it than her looking a bit ropey on what was obviously a bad hair day? Sure, okay, let's victim blame. Maybe it was just one of many cuts that Diana had received, and on this day, she had simply had enough. Perhaps it wasn't this one event, but a culmination of these kind of events happening for years to Diana. Carol ends with the fact that we shouldn't feel bad for this woman. Diana is the one guilty of using the press, not the other way around. According to Carol Malone. Oh, Malone. In another commentary, Diana is referred to as a dimwit, the reason for this is she won't just get an exercise bike and skip rope at home. No, she has to trapeze all across London in damp, straggly hair. How dare a woman use a gym and expect privacy? It's not only the media that is talking like this. It's also citizens of the UK. Here's a letter to the editor after the Diana paparazzi standoff. Quote, I really believe Princess Diana wouldn't do half the visits abroad to the underprivileged if there was no sign of cameras. It seems to be her forte to be well noticed. So why the fuss when she's photographed leaving her gym? End quote. Yes, let's completely ignore how bringing attention to causes she cares about, which makes sense to have press around, is different from trying to go to the gym as a regular person. But I think it's important to go back and revisit what was being said in that moment before she passed. Because I think there's been a pretty solid rewriting of history when it comes to Princess Diana. Another thing I'm not going to dive into too deeply is that we do get a lot of coverage and talk about Diana's body, despite the fact that at this point, the press knows that she has struggled with eating disorders. We get Diana too thin. We also get that she has cellulite. Later on in the summer, that she looks perhaps pregnant. 
There's forever a moving of the goalposts when it comes to Diana. Diana doesn't go to Wales because she doesn't want to overshadow her ex-husband, the future king. And then people get mad at her for not going because she promised she would. Kind of reminds me of a coronation invite. Can't quite put my finger on it. Interestingly though, up until this point, her love life is still centered on Dr. Khan. Depending on the day, they are either enjoying dinners together or they have broken up or he will marry her or he won't marry her. During a trip to Pakistan for charity, she ends up visiting with Dr. Khan's parents, which everyone sees as super weird. Then we have this article from June 8th, 1997, from fairy tale princess to little girl lost. This article seems to forget that her time being a princess was not a fairy tale. Goes on to say she is chucking friends who don't give in to her demands. Her staff quit as fast as leaves fall off trees in autumn. She's quarreled with her own family. She's daggers drawn at Kensington Palace with other royals. God, this feels like a cut and paste, but add in different names, doesn't it? And in case you found yourself questioning, was the media really all that gross? Listen to this. We got old Malone again, another Carol. Was Carol the predecessor to the Karen? Huh. Quote, Methinks Princess Diana's ill health has little to do with bulimia and everything to do with a fair, more dangerous condition, control freakitis. Carol, uh, I know this is about 20 years too late, but I'm going to advise you to maybe uh, get a joke writer. This wasn't it. And it is not the first time you see something like this written. It isn't until July of 1997 when the Al-Fayeds enter the picture. July 13th, 1997 is the first time I see Mohammed Al-Fayed mentioned. Dies freebie. Diana, Will, and Harry go on a yacht with Herod's boss, Al-Fayed, which is obviously a problem. And what you see over ensuing articles is the intersection of racism and classism. A lot of chatter surrounding if this is an acceptable person for Diana and her boys to be around. This commentary from August 1997 really encapsulates it. Al-Fayed might own Herod's, he might be rich, but he doesn't understand the British way. Here's a quote that kind of summarizes it all. Money might buy him an MP or two, but as he is having to learn the difficult way, money alone cannot purchase his entry into a social order whose structures he does not instinctively appreciate. I wonder why he can't appreciate them. And since this is one Stodies in the picture, there is concern about this kind of family and the Windsor's liaisoning. Racism is the undercurrent to all of this. For many summer vacations, in particular, this trip with the Al-Fayeds is seen as publicity seeking, and then we have to go into the penalties of seeking such publicity. There's discussion that perhaps she should leave Britain if she hates it so much. The editor-in-chief of Majesty Magazine at the time said that she definitely should not leave because, quote, her battle isn't with Britain, it's with herself. She's a prisoner of her own fame, end quote. God, it's weird that a UK outlet wouldn't want Princess Diana to leave the country. It's very much she's asking for it. Or she's going on vacation to, quote, bitchily try to grab the limelight on Camilla Parker Bowles' 50th birthday. Because remember, all two women are ever trying to do is best another woman. That is their purpose, which I argue is misogynistic for both of the women involved. But that is the narrative structure that the media has set up and continues to use. It finally breaks on August 7th, 1997, that Di's new man is Al-Fayed's son, Dodi Al-Fayed. And it quickly turns into how Di's love life is ruining the campaigns that she wants to work on, how this new love overshadowed her Bosnia trip. We have Dodi and Diana kissing, which just looks like two black blobs. But recall, the mirror paid 250,000 pounds for these photos. Also interestingly is while the photos are seen to be intrusive, they stop at any sort of privacy law that could extend to stop these kind of pictures because journalists need to be able to uncover corruption and wrongdoing. And it's hard because on the one hand, I always want to be team protecting a free press. I do think it's valuable, but it's interesting when talking about exposing wrongdoing and corruption that doesn't seem to extend to the British media itself. And we continue to see Doty fall out about the fact that he is unsuitable. He's too hairy. He's sleazy. There's just something I don't like about him. And then there's this particularly gross column by Bob Shields. He literally says that it seems Diana was sent a Herod's catalog and discovered she already owned everything in it. So she ordered a swarthy looking geezer whose picture was beside the foreword. He's basically accusing Diana of, I'll say it for you, quote, putting on a swimsuit show by day with old man Muhammad, and then getting with Dodi at night. 
It's gross. Were you not hugged as a child, Bob Shields? Then there's a lot of talk about his ex fiance American Kelly Fisher. She brought a million dollar lawsuit against him for breach of promise. Interestingly enough, Dodie's first wife comes out and is like, no, you guys were broken up before he got with Princess Diana. Stop it. Want to know who Kelly is represented by? Gloria Allred. Kelly also makes news by saying that Dodie is bad in bed. This is all under the pretense of protecting the princess, but I don't know. The coverage gets so bad that finally someone says something. Philip Nolan seems to prove that not all heroes wear capes. He straight up calls out the racism. Who would have ever thought that Princess Di would become the trophy of a rich Middle Eastern man asked the Daily Mail of her relationship with Dodi Fayed? Philip says he's a millionaire courting her, not someone trying to sell her into white slavery the way I screamed. And then, it's hilarious. They want Di to settle down with some chinless wonder from the Shires, but she has instead taken up with Johnny Foreigner. It's just not cricket, is it? I mean, poetry snaps. Poetry snaps right here. And then a somewhat ominous title, Will an English Rose Be Crushed in the Fast Lane? August 13th, 1997. Yeah, but not by Dodie, with Dodie. And then just days before her death, quote, Diana should forget all this bleeding about landmines and concentrate on her main occupation, swanning around the med in a swimsuit. Diana has only herself to blame. Princess Diana has a cheek to blame the British press for all of her ills, declaring that in her place, anyone sane would have left the country a long time ago. Diana and Kensington Palace have to deny attacks on Tories when she did an interview with a French newspaper about her landmine campaign. She's accused of dragging the British royal family into politics. She's doing too much. She's doing too little. She's not dating the right man. She's bringing it on herself. Stay out of politics. No, get into something worthwhile. No, go back to sunbathing. Until this, on August 31st, 1997. So yeah, maybe now we should ban landmines in Diana's honor, despite the previous year spent ridiculing her efforts. But also, let's not go too far. Let's not gag the press because of her death. We're sad, but let's protect our profit margin. But in case you're wondering if some of the stories that were ready to go up until her death, there was this one from the National Enquirer, which is a US-based tabloid. From the Washington Post, quote, a front page headline of the tabloid dated September 9th, printed before the car crash that took the lives of the princess and Herod's heir, Dodi Fayed says, Di goes sex mad and supposedly quotes her about her appetites. This was a sliver of the treatment and coverage that Diana received. And in some ways, her tragic, unfortunate, preventable death was just the beginning the beginning of a rewriting of history and an effort on the behalf of the UK press to ensure that Diana's death didn't encourage reactionary laws that would restrict their ability to get info, print pictures, etc. We will pick up on August 31st, 1997 in the next video. Stay tuned for more.